Last week, I was talking about power with a purpose. That was a blessing. Power with a purpose. The most expensive lamp in the world sold at auction for $2.8 million in New York. $2.8 million. What side of the bed does that lamp? $2.8 million. Let's say that that's the most expensive lamp in the world. And let's say the least expensive lamp or the cheapest lamp in the world was one cent. Let's just for the sake of illustration. If you take a bulb and you take the same identical bulb, you place it in each lamp. $2.8 million, one cent. Which will shine brighter? Come on. $2.8 million lamp here. Penny lamp. What shines brighter? <laughs> the same, is that right? They'll put forth the same amount of light. Because the purpose in which a lamp was created was to give forth light. So when it's fulfilling its purpose, when it's fulfilling its purpose, everything is the same. Whatever material, whatever value you place on something, it doesn't matter. When your purpose is being fulfilled, your light is shining. And when your light is shining, your light is no brighter. No one else's light is brighter than your light. If your light is shining, then that is what God wants you to do. All the other things is sinking sand. You can have the best of everything, but if your light is not shining to God, you're not working. So purpose is paramount. We can spend our whole life doing everything we ever want to do and miss our purpose. Little girl sent a paper in for essay. She gets the paper back. She says, wonderful illustrations, beautiful research, well-written, grade F. Answer, wrong assignment. You don't want to spend your whole life and be on the wrong assignment. Your purpose is what God will have you and only you to do. And when your purpose is there, the light shines to the world. And when your light is shining, it doesn't bring glory to you. When a light turns on, nobody looks at the lamp. You look at what the light illuminates. Is that right? So when your light is shining, it does not bring anything to you. It brings glory to your father. Let your light shine before men. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Today, Romans chapter number 12, verses number 4 through verse number 8. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. If you ever heard an orchestra, an orchestra has different sections. They have a first violin, second violin. You think that's just two people. No, that first violin is a section. You have 16 people playing first violin, or maybe 15 playing second violin. Same thing. Why is there such a duplication? Because when the orchestra comes together, and the cellos, and the strings, the basses, percussions, what you hear is symphony and harmony. But it takes a first violin, second violin, and if people are missing, something in that orchestra is missing. And when God brings us together, there's many gifts. Everybody has gifts. And you're meant to play a part. And when you play your part, suddenly it glorifies God. God is magnified. When you go into a church and everybody's playing a part, you can feel the presence of God. But if there are people who are there who do not want to take their position, and I want to take up that instrument. Your instrument may be just praise. But if you don't want to use your instrument that day, something is missing. And when people come into their, that place, you can feel it. What you, should, what you do should always give God the greatest glory. We looked at a scripture. Let's, if you can find Matthew chapter 28, 
verse number 19 and 20. We went over this scripture last week. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. That is called the great what? The great commission. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. It says, go ye therefore and do what? Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. Oh, am I, I'm too fast? Always, even to the end of the age. That's the Great Commission. Go, therefore. Straight. Don't stay. Go. You have an option. We can stay, but God is saying go. So what is there for me to go for? When you step out beyond you, God has things that he's prepared that is beyond you. And sometimes we want God to bring it to us. God says, no, it comes from you. And when you step out away from you, you step into your destiny. Your destiny is not the place where you are. Destiny is always a place apart from where you are. So if you want to fulfill your destiny, you've got to no longer stay here. You've got to go someplace, do something. Don't expect everything to come to you. When God has placed it there, God said it comes from you. So go, therefore. This says make disciples. That means it's going to be more than just you. That whatever you do is going to be more than just you. You cannot accomplish your mission with just you. So he says make disciples. That means there's somebody that's going to be on your team. You remember the dream team, the first dream team in the Olympics? What a, what a game. We could take all of the best of the NBA and we can go and we can play the other teams and, and come back world champions. And that's what God wants the best of you. If you give God the best of you, it's amazing what God will do with your life. God will make every one of us a world champion. But if we give him his, our best, that's all he wants from us, our best. Not give our best to the world or to the job. And when it comes to God, we just kind of mingle in, enter in, enter in. No, we come in with thanksgiving. Is that right? And we enter to his gates with praise. And when it's time to sing the songs of praise, don't let anybody stifle you. You sing it loud. You may be off key. It's all right. It's all to the glory of God. Because what God interprets it, God interprets it as praise. I got responses, and I'm so proud of the ones who sent responses because we're building our purposes around what you're telling us. What do you see here? What makes you come every week? There's got to be something that's happening here that we can say this is faith rising. And that's what we want from you. What is it that you see that magnifies the Lord? Not what you like, but what brings God glory? Every church serves chicken. We want to serve rotisserie chicken, honey dipped in a special sauce. <laughs> and when you bring an ingredient, when everybody brings an ingredient, it goes into that sauce. And when you give us your purpose, say, I believe this is about worship. And someone says, I believe this is about fellowship. Someone says, I believe this is about glory. And you provide that, it goes into the sauce. And when that sauce is done, people come in, they go, mm, oh, this, is, this is good. That's good worship. I got to go back there. There's something that's happening there that just don't happen anyplace else. But it took the commitment of everybody here to recognize that there's something that God wants to do with you. Not just with pastor. Not just with the praise band. One thing that I'm amazed at watching Cassie do after the worship service is the choir. The choir. Taking people who can't sing a note. No, just kidding. Oh, no. Now I just, I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Bad pastor. <laughs> but taking people who, who normally would not sing. Is that right? What, it, what tentative? Whether they want to be a part of this. But what have you noticed week after week? Not only is God starting to blend voices, but he's bringing out something in you. And you're finding there's fellowship there. There's enjoyment there. The presence of the Lord is there at every rehearsal, Cassie. And Cassie's in his glory. Cassie's like, no, okay, no. Huh? <laughs> and you get that right, and Cassie's like, all right. Now. And you're going, oh, man, this is good. And during your week, I know during your week, Chris, you were singing those songs. Is that right? You were singing those songs this week. And you were looking forward to what God is doing because God is taking people and he's bringing us together. He's molding us and creating purpose where there was no purpose before. 
I applaud the effort that it takes for you to come forward, just spend an extra hour, one hour or so, just after the worship service. And I'm hearing back there all the songs of praise that we're going to hear next week and all the effort that goes into it. You should be so proud of yourself. You should be so proud of yourself for what's going on. Number one says, wake up. In the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion. Uh, oh, come on. Okay, no more. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Cassie, Cassie, Cassie. Yes, yes, yes. Cassie, now how would they do this? In the jungle. Do you know this song, Cassie? But how would you do this song to get them in the mood? Well, <laughs> we, we'd have to go through the melody first. Okay, come on. We had to go through the melody first. Go ahead, Cassie. You knew I was going to do this, right? We start this on pitch. <laughs> All right. Uh, and the jungle, the mighty jungle, the light sleeps tonight. One more time. <laughs> that was good. Now, if there's different parts, if some, some may be different, can you separate a part or two? Just, just. Thank you, Cassie. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Was that silly or what? There's purpose to that, right? Everything has a purpose. The first time you sung it with me, you just kind of sung along. But as Cassie came in and started to share with you the harmony and pitch, and start to separate out that you have altos, you have basses, you have tenors, and you start to find out that you have a voice, and you start to blend that melody together, something began to happen just that quickly. When you find your part, and you allow God to use you, you'll be amazing the harmony that starts happening. But it cannot happen apart from you. When he sung that just then, some of you did not sing. That's all right. It's all right. What was missing in that element right there was you. There's something that God always wants to do with you as he makes you part of this team. And he'll use everybody to accomplish his will. My light is no brighter than anyone else's light. No matter what someone else has got, someone may live in a multi-million dollar home and somebody may be nearly homeless, but your light is just as bright. And you have just as much value to God. Use the light that God gives you. Use whatever God gives you to his glory. And watch God. Watch God magnify. You've watched Nick Walinda go across the Grand Canyon. That was just amazing. And what he used to do that was a balance pole. And that balance pole weighed 43 pounds. And the whole purpose of this was to get to the other side. That's it. But to get there, everything depended on his balance. And wherever you go in life, there's going to have to be balance. You're going to have to balance things in order to get across. And that balance means that you're going to have to accept some things and you're going to have to give up some things. You're going to have to do some things that are difficult and some things are going to be easy. There's going to be new friends and new opportunities, new places. To get to where you're going, you're going to have to disturb your balance of where you are and uptake something that is new. But it's going to require you to get there, you've got to balance things. Anybody ever sleepwalk or knew somebody that sleepwalk? I had a brother that sleep, we just sleepwalk. And he'd get up in the morning, and it was nothing to us. He'd get up in the morning. You could tell who's in his trance because he's trying to go to the bathroom in the kitchen or something like that. And my mother would say, get him, get him, and we just grab him, you know. <laughs> Shake him a few times, you know. <laughs> you know, and, and that was it. And one thing he did, he used to talk in his sleep too, which was kind of kind of bad because he, he got in trouble a few times talking in his sleep. Because he would say something like, uh, you know, mama gonna find out. And mama would hear, mama would say, What am I gonna find out? Well, where they put stuff, and he's talking in his sleep. Where? In the kitchen over there by the refrigerator. 
And he tells her something and he wakes up to a whipping. <laughs> Why is mama whipping me? Sleepwalking. Which means that he was alert as far as he was up and he was going along doing things, but he was not awake. And we can get in the habit of just going through life and never waking up. Some of you can do your job in your sleep. You can drive in your sleep. You can, you can do things so, it's, you're so rigid in what you do, you can do it in your sleep. It's time for you to wake up. Because in order for you to get beyond that, you've got to wake up. I see people every week that, in their little world, you see them in grocery stores, and you can tell the only, thing they, they, the only reason they leave home is to come to the grocery store and they get in a little cart, and they don't want anybody to bother them, and they're just little people, they sit there in their little world. And I love to get next to people like that in line. In fact, I'll break line to get in people next to How you doing? Fine. Is this a beautiful day today? Yes. My name is Jean. <laughs> I grew up here, I'm, and I'm just letting my light shine. But that little world is disturbed. When they get home, they're saying, oh, I can't believe it. I was there at Bashes and this little, this obnoxious little Negro man just came to me and started talking and he just was talking he, and he wouldn't be quiet. Oh, I'm going to have to change the day that I go now. I'll have to go another day. Oh, goodness. I hope he didn't follow me home. Oh, Lord, he may have followed me. That's called small world paranoia. When your world gets so small, it's all about you. And we get caught up into our small little world. We want things to change. Wake up. Things change when you truly are willing to change. It's not about us, right? It's not about us. We can build a whole world around us and be wrong. How many egotists does it take to change a light bulb? One. He holds the light bulb and the world revolves around him. <laughs> but sometimes we think that the world revolves around us. It's not about us. And the sooner we can grasp that, that God places some people in your life because they have a gift for you. In fact, let's look at the scripture again, the scripture from today, from Romans chapter number 12. It shares clearly our position as members. Romans chapter 12, verse number 4. As we have many members in what? One body. Many members. Your hands is a member. Your fingers, your, your legs, your, your organs, your eyes. All those are members. You have many members, but God doesn't duplicate members, right? He doesn't give you two sets of eyes. Two sets of ears. You have one. And God places those there because it serves your body. Many members, one body. It says, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are what? One. You see that? Being many are one. So when Christ looks in here, he doesn't see this person here and all the things. He sees one. And he intends for us to be one. Serving one body. Imagine if the hands and feet got into an argument and the hands are saying, man, we're, we're the hands. We're about everything. We can wave. We can play instruments. People like us. We can gesture. We can make things. But feet, you're just stuffy and smelly and you in the shoe all day. And they argue about this. And the hands say, well, let's, let's go across the room. The feet says, no, why don't you just wave? <laughs> why don't you make something? Because ultimately we need one another. <clears throat> For you to go where you need to go. There's somebody in this room that could help you. There's somebody that God has in this room. If you got to know the people in this room, you're amazed at what the people in this room that God has positioned to help you. Either in fellowship or relationship. In some area of your life, there are people right here that you need to know. And the only way that we'll get to know who those, <clears throat> those people are is we get to love right. 
we got to get the love right. That means learning how to give as well as receive. When you can get the love right, you learn that that love draws and attracts people and pulls people in. And out of that love relationship, God begins to build. And you begin to see things that you never have seen before. I know a lot of you, and I know some of you even more than others, but the reason why my relationship is more with some is because somehow we're able to give and receive more. That's what it's about. It's not that pastor is more favorable toward anybody else. When you have a relationship that's reciprocal, when you're giving and receiving, things happen in that relationship. But if you're closed, a small world, then you want things to happen for you. But deep down, you know that you're not willing to give the thing that you want to receive. And when you're not willing to give what you want to receive, you're going to find that your world will become increasingly smaller. Because you're suspicious. And you're wondering, what do people want from you? But ultimately, when you are letting your light shine and Christ is glorified, it's not you that people see. It's not you that they see. When your light is shining, they see more and more of Jesus. And one of your greatest compliments, when somebody looks at you and without you mentioning anything, start talking to you about Jesus. Isn't that something when they just start talking about Jesus? You're just in the store. You're just shopping. And somebody just comes to you and start talking about Jesus. That means that somewhere he's present. They won't talk about him unless they can see him. And if they can see him in you, then his name is going to come up somewhere in the vicinity. Every week, somebody should bring up Jesus. Not you talking about Jesus. Somebody should be in your vicinity talking about your church or where you come from or something about the quality and the character of your life that you know exemplifies Christ. Number one, we have to wake up. Number two, number two, enlarge your territory. Enlarge your territory. Let's look at First Chronicles chapter number four and verse number 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge what? Enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested, that I may not cause pain. Jabez was born, and his mother called him Jabez because it meant pain. And Jabez wanted to forever try and live down this reputation, this name that was given to him. And he was saying, God, in order for me to live down this name, enlarge my territory. See, as long as I was in Louisiana, in Mississippi, where I grew up in the town, I was little Gene. And I never would have been able to do very many things because they would never come as a chiropractor to little Gene. Oh, little Gene's a doctor now. Oh, look at him. That is so cute. Then grew up and got a chiropractic license. But no one in your, and Jesus said, in your own hometown, he's without honor. So in order for you to be what you really need to be, you have to enlarge your territory. Some of you may need to leave Phoenix to enlarge your territory. Or leave the job that you're on to enlarge your territory. I move away from home. I had to. God pushed me out of the house. Because I was up to my mom. She would have kept enlarging my high chair. Just making it bigger. <laughs> That's mom. But God has a plan, a destiny, and a, and a future for you. But to get there, you've got to enlarge your territory. That means those friends that you know and the people that you know and love, sometimes God said there's new friends, there's new people, there's new opportunity that's not here. But to get to there, enlarge your territory. To become more, we have to be willing to do more. Expand our thinking, our mind. Even back down south, I try to get people to leave past the county line. See, they still think sometimes that you can't cross over. You don't know what those people are going to do cross there. Come out to my wedding. We got married. I had to pay for people to come to the wedding. 
And they still, some still wouldn't go, wouldn't come. Because they couldn't wait to get back to the little small territory. And I go back home and I look at the people that I used to admire, the guys that were scoring the winning baskets and the people that were doing all these great things and they're still in that little small territory. And all the things that could have happened if they'd only had seen that God has even more in store. But you have to enlarge. So JBS prayed that God enlarge my territory that I may not cause pain. Everyone has a sense of, first of all, love. I talked about love a moment ago. The next is a sense of belonging. We all have a reason to, re to belong to something, to be a part of something that's working. You want to join something that's working because it brings value to you. But the greatest sense of belonging that we have is that we want to do something that is great in our lives. Everybody has a desire to do something that is great and awesome. And that didn't come from other people. That's something that God placed in you to do great things, to go way beyond where you are and expand, that you can look back and you can see something that's happened and you know could only have been God that allowed you to accomplish what you've been able to accomplish. Become part of something that you maybe not join. Become part of a group. But join the choir was great. What else can you become part of? What other parts of your territory can you expand? Peer groups, Toastmasters, speaking clubs, writing clubs, art, take classes, enlarge your territory. Nothing is going to just keep coming to your little small world. God is trying to push us out to become bigger, to become more expansive. Number three, redefine yourself. Redefine yourself. I talked to Dr. Judy today, uh, a few days ago. You know we have another doctor in the house. Is Dr. Judy here? Just wave your hand, Doc. Is she here? There she is back there, Dr. Judy Jones. She's a naturopath, and that's a holistic doctor who believes in the natural approach to healing. So I talked to her about balance and how do we balance our lives, and, and I was expecting the doctor's answer, but it came down to real simple love, peace, family, friendships, and all the things that we know are true values in life. Balancing those things. Family. Your family should expand to include not just your immediate family, but your church family. If you don't have family that's here, you have a family now. Get to know your family more. Enlarge. Become more inclusive. Proverbs chapter number 30, verse number 8. It says, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and still and so dishonor the name of my God. Saying, God, give me neither too much nor too little. If I have too much, God, I may become proud and disown you. With too little, I may become a beggar and still dishonor you. God does not give us too much blessing nor too much burden. Because God knows that there's a delicate balance between the two that keeps us humble. <clears throat> enough burden to humble you, but enough blessing to encourage you. And God knows that you need both. Don't give me too much, God, of one side. I, don't give me too much of another. Because God knows that you have to balance who you are. And he knows that when you're able to receive more, God gives you more. But it's about you expanding, desiring to want to step out. <laughs> You don't want more just because you want more. You want more because, God, I feel like I'm, I can honor you more. God, enlarge my territory. Create a ministry burden in me. God, I want to do more for the kingdom. And when you desire those things, God will give you territory and people. And when God blesses you, I'm going to show you how God blesses you. He blesses you in ways that your natural person does not want to be blessed. Because he'll bless you with a lesser paying job. Or he'll bless you with the opportunity to take a lower position. That does not make sense, God. I said, bless me, and you give me an opportunity here that I, I don't want this job. God, I don't want this blessing. Because if we don't understand God, then we'll miss it. Because we're rejecting what God is trying to do. But to receive that requires humility. Bless me, God, in ways that I can understand, ways that I approve of. 
Bless me, God, in ways that, that makes me feel good. There was a gentleman in Detroit, I mean, in, in Miami, called Chicken Man. And Chicken Man was selfish. Everything was about him. And they watched this man in his later years with a shopping cart. Inside the shopping cart were two dolls, two girl dolls, and a picture of a woman. And Chicken Man would go around all day and he would make these clucking noise. Chicken. Everybody say, that's Chicken Man. He's crazy. He lost his mind. But Chicken Man had a story. Chicken Man may have been like some of us. We thought so much of ourselves that we missed the opportunity around us. Chicken Man had a family. And one night, the house caught on fire. Being true to his nature, he saved himself. He ran out of the house, and when he got outside, he heard his girls and his wife screaming. He runs back to try and save them. He opens the door, and there was just too many flames. He tries to find them, and he can hear them screaming inside. And then he heard it cease as they perished in the fire. His brother-in-law shows up at the scene. And he sees him standing out there. And he asks him, where's the family? Where are your children? And, he just, and he's screaming, you know, they're, they're, they died. And he recognized that this guy had let his family down. And he grabs him and starts beating him. He says, you're a chicken. You leave your family behind. You're nothing but a chicken. And just keeps beating this guy. And calling him a chicken. When this guy comes to, everything in his life had changed. And this new persona, this chicken Mindset. So now he goes around with this cart, making noises like a chicken. Because he was so engrossed in himself that he missed the very purpose and nature of what he was meant to be. You don't want to live your whole life and get to the other side and people are perishing. Because ultimately, ultimately this is going to be all over. And the reason why I talk about being family is not about you. It's about the people out there that are perishing. And when we can get that right in here, it's not about you showing up every Sunday and feeling good, giving you a good message. Oh, that's a good word, Pastor. Oh, that was a good one. This is not about you being exhorted every week. It's about knowing that there's a bigger purpose in why you show up every Sunday so that you can gain what you need. And when you leave out of here, that the world will be a better place. People are perishing every day. And we're just watching them pass by because we don't want to get involved. Let's invite some people from the neighborhood. Let's go out and pass off a flash. Oh, I don't know. That's not me. Lives are being lost. Families are breaking up. Marriages are dissolving. And we go home every day. And we watch TV and we have our cheesecake. And we enjoy ourselves. And we keep doing it again and again. But ultimately the Bible says that I will give account one day. Not how good I made myself feel. Not how satisfied I was with my life. But I'm going to have to answer that question. Did you help somebody? When you saw me hungry, did you feed me? When you saw me naked, did you clothe me? When I was sick, did you come and visit me? Jesus, when did I see you hungry and didn't feed you? I, I saw you naked and didn't clothe you. I saw you in prison and didn't come to you. When did, I, did that happen, Jesus? As you have done it to the least of these you have done it unto me.